think it's Monday. It must be Monday because it's time for another Religious Studies Project podcast. I'm Dave McConaughey, and today I'm joined by Bray Fallon. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing quite well. You know, the weather has finally turned here in Massachusetts and everything's blooming gorgeously. We're still all in isolation, but on our our daily walk that we take, uh, all the flowers are out, the turtles are out, the geese are out, the muskrat, the beaver, all, all the things that we can enjoy on our little natural trail that we've got across from from where we live. It's it's delightful. Uh, today, I think we are going to be talking about some things in this podcast episode that are a little bit more challenging. Um, and uh, we're delighted to bring you a conversation by a brand new interviewer for the RSP, Brett Asaki. Um, who did he have a chance to speak with, Bree? Um, so Brett spoke to um, Joel and Thomas, and they talked about race, religious freedom, and empire in post-war Japan. Take it away. Welcome to sunny San Diego. Uh, I'm Brett Asaki and really excited to talk about your book today. Um, so the book Faking Liberties, Religious Freedom in American Occupied Japan, uh, it's about a lot of things, uh, but uh, primarily as of area about Japan before, during, and after uh, the American occupation. Uh, but it's also interestingly a reflection upon the United States and its projects abroad. Uh, so can you briefly introduce the book's thesis uh, and list a few of the items of comparison across the countries? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for uh, for taking the time to do the interview. Um, I'm Jolian Thomas, and uh, really pleased to be here. Um, so the book's main thesis is that there's this story that's been told that um, the United States brought religious freedom to Japan at the end of uh, the Second World War. Um, and as I was looking at this history, I, I was really struck by the fact that it just seemed to not be true. Now, it turns out that the United States did bring religious freedom to Japan, only it had brought religious freedom to Japan much earlier in the 1850s right. um, as part of a sort of diplomatic package. And indeed, the concept of religion comes to Japan in that time. Um, but the the sort of triumphalist occupation era narrative about the United States bringing religious mm -hmm. freedom to Japan is a really problematic story because it, 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 sets up the the Americans as being sort of the the holders of freedom and the Japanese as being this benighted people that need to be saved or rescued by the Americans. So right. uh, I was really inspired by uh, literature and secularism and, and secularity studies uh, and thinking through the ways that religious freedom is a really good um, topic for thinking about what secularism is. But um, I was also trying to make a, an intervention in the um, history of uh, Japan and the United States, thinking perhaps a little more critically about um, American empire, uh, and then thinking uh, perhaps a little bit more, what's the way to put this, like um, in, in, a, in, in a sort of radical credulity about one of these claims um, that, that Japanese people in the pre-war and wartime period made that Shinto was not a religion. Mm -hmm. And so one of the mm -hmm. things I wanted to do was to sort of like take that claim at face value and think, well, what, what would the history look like if that, if that turned out to be true? Right. So um, that kind of explains one of the, the, the shifts you make from going from essentialist and functionalist definitions of a freedom of religion to more of a uh, projects or claims making. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you walk us through that, uh, that transition? Yeah. So one of the things that really struck me uh, in in thinking about the occupation era narrative about you know Japanese people don't have religious freedom is that it basically makes it an essentialist claim saying like Japanese people as such sort of in their being don't get it and right. uh, and you know I think that many of us you know in the academy in 2019 were um, well aware that we should avoid essentializing claims, but there's still a lot of them that sort of lurk out there. Um, they're sort of shambling around in our midst, right? And so, um, the first, you know, the first sort of correction for that is the suspicious move to, to do the functionalist claim, like what's really happening behind the scenes, right? right. And I, I think that, um, for most of the time that I've been professionally studying religions in Japan, I've seen more of the functionalist move where it's like, well, um, Shinto is essentially a religion of Japanese people, and state Shinto is functionally the political co-optation of this right. benign, you know, ancient religion or whatever. But it turns out that the scholarship has shown that, like, both of those claims are just not 
not accurate. And and one of the things that I really push in, in, a, in a more constructivist bent is to look at who speaks about um, Shinto uh, and, and about religious freedom and um, how do they engage in projects of religion making. Um, so, uh, you know, the, in the critical secularisms and secularities literature, there's a, a sort of focus on the constructed nature of both religion, the co-constructed nature, mm-hmm. I should say, of both religion and, and secularism. Um, and so as I was thinking through those issues, uh, it was it was very obvious that religious freedom is a place where you see religion making happening in real time, because to free religion, people have to uh, designate one thing as religion and something else is not religion. And uh, so I I find that to be sort of endlessly fascinating uh, and and, uh, fun to think think through and with. So to try to summarize that, um, there are these two projects of secularization or kind of defining what religion and what non-religion is, Mm -hmm. both within uh, Japan, pre-war Japan, and then also in the United States in this later occupation. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a nice line of comparison uh, having those two. Um, So uh, uh, one thing I'd like to turn to um, is one of these provocative claims you've made, but I think it's actually, as the argument goes uh, in your book, uh, a quite uh, tempered claim, in my, from my view, um, that religious freedom and human rights have been used uh, functionally as tools of empire. And that's the, the term you use. Mm-hmm. Um, can you explain what you mean by that term, tool of empire, uh, and maybe provide an example? Sure. So I think I'm not alone in making this sort of claim. And just to give a sort of shout out to other scholars working in the in the field of sort of cr- what we might call critical religious freedom studies, Tisa Wenger's uh, book, Religious Freedom, um, uh, I forget the subtitle, something about an American ideal, uh, is it, she, she used this, this idea about religious freedom sort of as... Um, you know, white settlers move west, then they take religious freedom with them, and it helps them occupy territory and so forth. Um, you know, writing in a more contemporary period, Elizabeth Shackman Hurd has talked about the global promotion of religious freedom, or what she calls international religious mm-hmm. freedom. And, and you know, this is something that the Trump administration takes very seriously, but so did the Obama administration before it, and so mm-hmm. forth. And the reason that this is... Um, a uh, sort of tool of empire is that it's a way for Americans to um, to assert a certain type of moral superiority and to uh, even if not dominating politically another territory and population, the language of religious freedom allows Americans to sort of assert a certain degree of political hegemony. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the book, uh, there are two main examples of this, I would say. Um, chapter three looks at territorial Hawaii, which is um, at the time, you know, an American territory, not a state. I'm looking at Hawaii in, in the um, 1910s and 20s mostly. And there, under the plantation economy, religious freedom and the notion of sort of white Christian supremacy work hand in hand. So uh, to make a long story very short, Japanese American Buddhists um, make an attempt to use the language of religious freedom, and they fail utterly, right? And and this is part of, and, and the reason they fail is that um, there's a very... Uh, carefully constructed political economy of the um, of the islands. And if Japanese people are allowed to use religious freedom, then that really calls into question the sort of white supremacy that dominates right. that. And the other place is, of course, the occupation itself. Um, Japan is an autonomous state. It has its own sovereignty at this, at this stage. But mm-hmm. I would say that it's fair to describe Japan as a client state. It's utterly mm-hmm. dependent on the U.S. Um, military presence uh, in a very conflicted way. Um, and Japan is America's, uh, you know, the, the forward base for the United States in East Asia. That reflects the geopolitics of the Cold War. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on using Japan as a sort of place to uh, maintain freedom of navigation and the Pacific and so forth. Right. All of that is to say um, religious freedom was central to the um, occupation project. It was one of the main rationales for why the United States needed to be in Japan in the first place. Um, these people, we, we fought a war with them. They fought the war because of their religion. Their religion is bad. We're going to fix it. And having fixed it, then we're going to incorporate them under the sort of uh, military umbrella of the United States. So, uh, you know, we could we could parse the term empire uh, 
right. all day. Um, but but I'm totally comfortable with thinking of America as an empire, and and I think that that's quite accurate um, in in many respects. Well, I mean, we can also use the adjective like empirical, or you know, like uh, what things related to those um, those goals. Sure. Um, can we also categorize other similar freedoms spread abroad with the same kind of analysis of projects? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, you know, other people have talked about this sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that immediately comes to mind when you ask this question is um, is, is sort of gender and women's rights. Right. Um, I think, uh, you know, we see a lot of Americans um, really worked up about genital cutting um, mm-hmm. and uh, in, in a very complicated way. And there, there are a number of scholars who have who have worked on sort of um, calling that into question, but you know they're sort of saying like women need to be uh, protected from um, either from themselves or from the terrible men who are um, doing stuff. And, and of course, um, you know Saba Mahmoud has has talked about this sort of thing with veiling, and and um, there are others uh, um, like Rick Schrader at the University of Chicago who have uh, written articles on genital cutting and so forth, where there are double standards that are applied. And so one of the things that I think is really interesting in, in thinking about the U.S. project of spreading freedoms abroad is that we often operate under double standards where what we do at home is a little bit different from what we project overseas. And, right. and I think that we really need to sort of slow down and pay attention to that dynamic because it's, 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 uh, it's insidious in its worst instantiations. From maybe my interests and my lines of questioning, maybe you um, have a, a, like a presumption maybe <laughs> of a kind of uh, underlying interest that I have. Um, and that's really your experiences of racialization and how that forms your scholarly perspective. Um, now, I'm, I'm not imposing this on your book, <laughs> but in fact, it's uh, explicitly stated in the epilogue. Um, you're a multiracial African-American, if uh, that's the right terms you'd like to use to identify sure. yourself. Um, and without giving away the book's awesome finale, stated in musical form, really cool. Um, can you just touch upon maybe how your study of Asian religions in particular uh, has been affected by your own experiences of racialization. Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, so one of the things that struck me as I was getting into the archival materials for this book was how frequently the occupiers described themselves as white mm. and um, how they also positioned themselves as sort of... Th- so they thought of America as white. And, you know, the, the American armed forces were still segregated at this time. Uh, the, um, and, and sort of America's self-understanding, um, was, was figured around whiteness. Right. Um, and as a non-white person, um, that really, you know, was jarring. Um, but it also was one of the things that I, um, you know, it is part of this longer sort of, you know, autobiography, I guess, that I that I share in, in a brief form in the epilogue, which is that, you know, if you're a non-white person in the United States, then it's very obvious, I think for, for I, I shouldn't speak for all of us, but I, I'll just speak for myself. Mm-hmm. It was really obvious to me growing up that when Americans talk about freedom, that freedom is not extended to all of us equally. Mm-hmm. And so um, I saw a lot of work in the critical religious freedom literature tearing apart the word religion, and, and very important to do. Right. I saw less on freedom. Mm. And I thought that freedom was something that really needed to be addressed uh, more directly and to think about how there are both emancipatory and coercive qualities to freedom and that different people in different groups get freedom in different ways. Mm-hmm. One of the things that... Um, that uh, so I, I the the epilogue as you've seen is very it's written in a very personal tone. I had a lot of trepidation in sort of putting it out there in the world. Um, so far, when when I've heard from people, uh, you know, generally the, the the response has been positive for people who have already read the book. But um, one thing that I that I noticed is that a number of people um, said that it was an it, it that my project was an activist project mm. um and so you know in, in the introduction i say very explicitly it's not an activist project for all of these reasons um but one of the things that that people were taking away having read the epilogue was that this that this made the book an activist project and i've been thinking about that recently mm. and this goes to your question about racialization because i think that that reading is actually a racialized right. reading of the book so in other words if i were say like a white american and i closed the book by being like oh i went on the jet program and i had this 
lovely experience in this small town in rural Japan, <laughs> nobody would read that as an activist. They'd just be like, oh, that's just a book, right? right? But because I'm talking about my experience as a racialized, you know, minority in the United States, and I, because it's built into the sort of apparatus of the book, suddenly the book becomes activist. And I think we really have to think about, you know, what sort of burden that places on um on you know minoritized or racialized um, scholars of religion and and what we can do about that because sorry this is turning into a sort of long rant but but one of the things that that I, I think is that there's a this is the epilogue was designed to sort of show rather than tell but it was showing the value of diversity in the academy right, right? and if diversity looks like activism mm. then we have a huge problem right. Right. So I, I, I think that one of the things that I would I would really like my hope for people reading the epilogue is that they're like, oh, this is this represents why diverse voices are valuable in the academy. This represents right. why we need to, you know, foster diversity in, in the lower ranks of, of the, the academy and so forth. So. Right. So uh, it, it, the, the, uh, there's so much in there to unpack. Um, I, I would like to actually walk back to more of your archival sure. discussion. Like, uh, so you're. Let's take us back to, back into that time. You're looking at this archive, and then over and over, you're reading with the name America mm -hmm. some reference, either explicitly or implicitly, to concepts of whiteness. Yeah. Um, what goes through your mind mm -hmm. as you're going through this archive? I, and again, I'm I'm trying to help you out here with the, uh, and, and I do that myself. Uh, to you know, your your experiences shape your lens. They don't make your project's activism. Right, right, right. right. So I'm, I'm trying to help you help, help, uh, help articulate that. Yes. Um, that process. Yes. Great. Okay. So, um, let me just talk about the archive in general. It's actually multiple archives in the United States and Japan. So I'm looking at American military government records, um, at the national archives and records administration, uh, that's in college park, Maryland. And also there, uh, is this fabulous collection at the university of Maryland called the Prang collection. Uh, during the years of the occupation, every document that was published in Japanese was censored. So, you know, uh, there's this irony in the occupation um, to promote freedom of expression that the occupiers censor everything. Um, right. <laughs> to, to promote religious freedom, they, they, squat, they quash some religious groups and so forth. They, yeah. uh, I talk about this in great detail in the book. But so the Prang Collection has all of these censored documents. And then I was looking at archives in Southern California and Oregon from people who had been um, influential on off occupation policy or, or active in the occupation, as well as archives in Japan. Um, so uh, government records, um, um, a lot of magazines and so forth. One of the things that um, I noticed uh, as I was going through the American military government records was that they told a very sort of hasty story mm -hmm. of um, the Japanese past, the recent Japanese past. Right. And their story was, um, was designed to make Japan look like it um, was an inferior um, sort of uncivilized place. Right. And so, um, you know, with the concept, and I'm, I'm, I want to stress the concept of civilization here for a second, like really spell that out, because civilization was the sort of dominant frame for understanding the world in, mm -hmm. in the first half of the 20th century and in the late 19th century. And so civilization was basically equated with whiteness, right? right. And so anytime the Americans are talking about civilization, they're often, if not explicitly, at least mm -hmm. implicitly, sort of tying this to these people who are insufficiently white, right? right? And of course, um, th those people who know the history will know that Japan has had this sort of ambiguous status in, in geopolitically because um, Japan was an empire in its own right. Japan um, pre sort of staved off being colonized by colonizing the other countries of Asia. Mm -hmm. And that's a very complicated history that I won't go into in, in too much detail. But um, so... So where does that leave the the scholar? Um, well, I felt like I had a responsibility then to unpack the stories that Japanese people were telling about themselves. Right. How did they think of themselves? How did they mobilize the language of civilization in a different way? Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, at first I thought I was just writing a book about the the years of the occupation, but it turned out that I needed to write a whole half of the book that was about whatever was happening before the occupation to really let Japanese people speak in their own voices. And strikingly, what, one of the things that happened is a lot of them are saying a lot of stuff about religious freedom, and they're 
laughing at the United States through a lot of it. A lot of them are just like, look at those crazy Americans. Like they are way too lax with their laws about religious freedom. We're going to, we're going to use religious freedom, but we're going to do it our own way. And I think that that's a very important kind of story. Um, And, and of course, just amplifying the Japanese voices in all of their complicated, conflicted ways is, is part of the project of the book. So uh, one thing you're pointing out, pointing to is that quick summarization of uh, what Japan used to be. Right. So mm-hmm. what are we doing now as an American project? What was Japan before this? Right. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the interesting things you point to is how they drew upon religious studies scholars to make this claim about what Japan used to be like. Um, and so this actually uh, uh, discusses uh, like this major discussion you have about the, uh, the, the, the politics of religious studies scholarship. Yeah. Right. And so here you have an example where. Um, you know, who, I don't know if the, the, those scholars really thought of themselves as world influencing <laughs> in terms of their work. However, they ended up being it. And so one major portion of your book is called the occupation of religious studies. And, and obviously you have a double entendre there with the job as well as the American occupation. Um, and there were some really interesting points you made through this um, like probably secondarily archival work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but there's these terms of a spiritual vacuum. Mm. And also what happens after the American occupation, the flourishing of new religions. And mm. so this new term, new religions and new religious movements and other mm. terms that come out of there actually come out of this um, uh, definition of what Japan was like before mm. and then what it was like after. Um, so reflecting on these discussions, um, uh, maybe... Uh, well, you can maybe parse out some of that for, 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 the, for the listeners, but also just you know, maybe words of advice about you know, us as scholars of religion um, and uh, what our pl- potential political impact can be based on our ways of framing uh, uh, religions. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for that question. Um, okay, so this, I'm going to answer by looping back to an earlier part of our conversation with the activism stuff. So right. the reason I said that it was deliberately not an activist project was precisely because so much stuff that I was seeing in the archive was scholars of religion adopting a prescriptive tone saying, you know, this is good religion, that's bad religion. Right. This is um, superstition, that's, you know, real religion and that sort of thing. Um, right. I, I think the category of state Shinto, which I alluded to before, it has that whole story built into it. Two words, and it's a whole story, right? right. Um, and so uh, I wanted to be very deliberate. I, of course, there's always going to be some sort of prescription that we're doing. I, but I think that in general, um, for, for me, I think the first order level of prescription is about scholarly method. And, and if, there's a, if there's an intervention I'm making in the book, it's like, okay, how do we periodize? How do we tell our stories? What, whose voices are we paying attention to? And that sort of thing. Those are the kinds of things that I, I think I'm very explicit about in, in the book. Um, on, on reflection, I think I could have been even more um, deliberate or, or taken a little bit more time to... to um, in this case, rather than show, like actually tell people what I was doing in terms of my um, playing with chronological presentation, the mm-hmm. book is organized chronologically, but it's also not organized chronologically. Right. And, and, and that was my way of sort of like doing the historical method, but also like kind of screwing with it at the same time. Uh-huh. Um, but, uh, but in terms of these, um, the, the sort of nitty gritty of what was happening in the occupation um, before, during, and, and immediately after the occupation, um, we have scholars of religion who are, um, really minor until they become major because of a sudden policy need. So the person I have in mind is um, Daniel Clarence Holtum, who's a Baptist missionary, who's um, a scholar of Shinto, and nobody's reading his stuff, really, right? He's completely um, underappreciated. I mean, I think a small number of people but are, are looking at him, but um, in as, as after Pearl Harbor, uh, the sort of dominant narrative at the time was that Japanese people were um, ultra-nationalist because of Buddhism, Mm -hmm. not Shinto. And then somebody uh, in uh, the State Department or in in the um, Office of, of Strategic Services finds Holtum's work and and they're like, oh my God, this guy is is this expert who's been telling us all of this stuff about um, why Japanese people are the way they are. And so suddenly Holtum's work has this whole new life where it's explaining Japanese ultranationalism. Right. So this guy comes to, and, and then he, he ends up having like an outsized role after being, you know, on the margins of, of the scholarly community. And so his ideas about the nat- Shinto as the national faith of Japan and so forth come to inform a lot of policy. 
This is particularly the case in the fall of 1945, when the occupiers have a sudden policy change that's dictated by Washington. And um, the people in Washington are, are suddenly announced on public radio, on American public radio, that um, Shinto as a state religion is going to be mm-hmm. abolished. The occupiers stationed in Japan, this is the first they were hearing of it, and then they suddenly had to um, come up with a policy to support this objective. Right. They had to come up with a reason to support this objective while also protecting and promoting religious freedom, which is an impossible task. So the only way to make that work is to designate Japan's quote unquote national religion as not being religion or, or as being sort of insufficiently, um, distinguishing between the religious and the political. How do you do that? You go to scholarly experts. Mm. And so they relied on Holtum's work. And then they also relied on local Japanese scholars of religion, uh, particularly this guy, Kishimoto Hideo. Um, and, uh, were asking them to basically support this foreordained objective. And sure enough, by 15 December uh, of that year of 1945, you get this document called the Shinto Directive, which formally abolishes this thing that they have now come to call state Shinto. And, and one thing I just want to put here, a sort of asterisk to all of this, is that the language of quote-unquote state Shinto doesn't solidify until December 1945. It is not something that is widely used um, in, in Japanese or in English up until that point. And that's really really crucial. And in the book, you do a really good job of pointing out the kind of lineage of the debates but within Japan about the relationship of religion to the state. And so it's very clear from that that there is no solidification of, of the state Shinto idea. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so uh, I think what this is actually is, is bringing it back to uh, maybe some of the earlier points about racialization. Right? Mm-hmm. So... Um, uh, Instead of it being an activist work, um, it's really maybe, uh, and, and you can rephrase this how you want, um, your experiences shape your lens. Uh, that lens would be obvious to, you know, with, <laughs> that, that lens is obvious to anyone who's had similar ra- experiences of racialization. On the other hand, um, maybe another scholar would take some of these uh, assumptions about state Shinto for granted. Yeah. Um, can you maybe... Uh, Loop those together, like uh, um, how your own experience of racialization allows you to break free oh, of yeah. that um, that presumption that the previous religious studies scholarship was was fully accurate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that question. Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of build on what we were just talking about with state Shinto and tie it to this other concept that may be lurking in some listeners' minds, which is civil religion. Okay, so um, Robert Bella starts off. You know, as I understand it, basically Talcott Parsons tells Robert Bella, like, you're going to do Japan. And then he, like, writes this book, Tokugawa Religion, right? And, uh-huh. and, but then he ends up, like, kind of shifting focus and he, he ends up being one of these major sociologists of, of, um, American religion and so forth. And we're all very indebted to him. One of the things that one of his most influential essays is about America's civil religion. And I think one of the, um, one of the, things that a lot of people forget, um, maybe a lot of our Americanist colleagues forget, is that Bella's experience studying Japan directly affects his civil religion essay. And there's even a footnote in that essay where he's like, I'm not talking about an American Shinto, which I think says exactly that that's what he's doing, right? Um, (laughs) There's this sort of proleptic quality to that that I think um, is is really, really telling. So I have just like maybe one or two pages in, in chapter one where I'm talking about how to Bella, writing in his time, 1967, uh, I think it is, um, he's capable of telling a story about America's civil religion that picks um, a set number of saints and heroes and monuments and so forth. Um, and uh, he's talking about things like national sacrifice, but look at who he's including and not including. Right. There is no mention of blackness. There's no, like, there, black people are not present in his story. And let's repeat the date. 1967. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so there's, it's just, it's like utterly striking. And so, you know, when, when I, I've had a number of colleagues say, well, actually, isn't, shouldn't, wouldn't uh, civil religion be helpful in talking through like the, your critique of state Shinto? And I want to say, no, like I want to flip the table over and say, no, this is not helpful because Bella was both using a racialized notion of Japan to tacitly to build his argument about American civil religion. He's rejecting what's going on in Japan to say, well, what we do is actually really good. And it's, it, it's, it's like the, the healthy stuff that bonds us all together. That's exactly what Japanese people were saying about 
about what they did not call state Shinto, but they they called like um, the Imperial Way or or shrine rites or whatever. They had lots of different names for for this stuff. Um, and uh, you know, th- one of the things that um, that that Bella's I, you know, I mentioned this explicitly um, in in Bella's uh, in my discussion of Bella's piece, but there's no reference to Martin Luther King. There's no reference. It's certainly no reference to Malcolm X. Mm-hmm. I mean, can you imagine, right? <laughs> um, but but these are people who are speaking in prophetic voices. They're talking about the problems of the American project. There's and and so it's just. Um, I think to to answer your question directly. I see that because of the way that I am, um, you know, because of the circumstances of my embodiment. I'm sure that, I'm, I'm, and I would not say that um, a white person would not see that, right? I want to be very clear here. Um, but I but I think that because of, you know, growing up um, with a sort of ambiguous uh, sort of racial identity as a, as a multiracial person, um, it's always been sort of in my face. Like I've never, I've never been able to not think about about race, right? And um, and so uh, it took me a long time to figure out why I was so dissatisfied with the civil religion explanation. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually wasn't until very late in the book that I finally came up with my answer for it. But it has to do with this with this issue, like the the circumstances of of who I am, the nature of of um, of uh, you know where I was born, how I grew up, and all that stuff affects uh, how I approach the archive and, and so forth. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, uh, w- uh, one more thing, um, and this is just kind of like a nuts and bolts thing. So we've mm-hmm. discussed all the origins of the, the creation of the term state Shinto. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yet still, and I have to admit it for myself, when I'm doing Introduction to World Religions, there it is. It's the mm-hmm. term state Shinto is there, and, and you discuss it. Um, is there like a nuts and bolts better way to describe what was happening uh, in preoccupation Japan? Yeah. Um, I, I think we just need to talk about Japanese secularism. I describe it as a, a secularism. I describe the, what I call the Meiji constitutional regime as a secularist system. It's premised on the distinction between religion and not religion. Um, and I mean that in, in two ways. There's like the forbidden not religion, which is things that end up being called superstitions and so forth. And then there are the permitted um, or even encouraged not religion, which is the sort of compulsory shrine rites where like you'd get a bunch of school kids to go to the shrine and pay their respects or like bow to a, peer, a picture of the emperor. Um, that's secularism. That's what's happening in America too, at exactly the same time. There's like a sort of um, a, a sense, this is what Bella would call America's civil religion, but I, but I think it's actually much more complicated than that. I don't want to reduce things to religion. I want to maintain the complexity of um, the, the language games that people play in terms of parsing things as being religion or not religion, right? And, and I think that collapsing everything into the category of religion actually misses, misses part of the point. So, um, I, I, it is not my job to police what other people say. Um, I know that I will be like shouting into the wind and, and there are going to be people who, who insist on using the term state Shinto, but I really think that historically it's just inaccurate. And, um, so if you're in the classroom and you're teaching your world religions class or whatever, what do you do? Well, Use that, use Japan as an opportunity to talk through the issues of secularism more broadly. Say, we used to tell a story this way. Our textbook or or our readings use this term, but, um, you know, this is actually reflective of a different sort of politics of, of, you know, good and bad religion. Let's talk about that. Let's tie it to contemporary things. Like when people are saying Islamism, what are they doing? Mm-hmm. I argue in the book that Islamism is basically like the state Shinto of our day. It's, it's taking something and describing it as being illegitimate because it's, um, by, just by adding that ism to mm-hmm. the end. And, and I, and I, I think there are a lot of other examples that we could use. That's, that's the one that immediately comes to mind, right? Um, so, you know, in one of your earlier questions, you were asking about um, the sort of impact of scholars of religion. And, and, and one of the things that I do at the, in the last chapter of the book is to show how um, these things, categories like state Shinto, for example, um, they have echoes uh, and they continue to influence the academy, um, our classrooms, uh, policymaking, and so forth. And so, if we can attend to when the moments when those uh, categories are developed historically, if we can pay attention to the um, politics of that moment, 
then we can also pay attention to how those echoes are working in our contemporary moment. It's not to be presentist, it's just to say that there's there are problems in the state Shinto concept. So let's deal with those. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You've got, given us a lot to think about. Um, f- religious freedom, secularism, secularization, um, uh, the concepts we use, the kind of politics that we either implicitly or explicitly uh, work through as religious studies scholars. So thank you so much for your, your time today and, and your excellent work. Thank Faking you. Liberties, Religious Freedom, and American Occupied Japan. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed your questions and the conversation. Really appreciate it. Listening to that episode, it really brought to the fore to me a few things that I've been seeing on the news at the moment. Um, In particular, some of the protests that have been occurring in the States in regards to um, COVID restrictions and COVID lockdowns and the way they are potentially racially coded. Now, I'm not in the States, so I don't know that much about it. But Dave, could you sort of tell me if I'm on the right track? Is that sort of linked to what um, Joel and Brett were talking about here? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. There's a a movement in the US as some states and some authorities feel that it's the right time to begin opening social activities back up. There are other states that are not opening things back up. And even within states, there are areas that are open and areas that are less open. And many Americans are uh, confused about COVID and how long we should all be isolating and sequestering ourselves and doing social distancing. But there is a small and very vocal minority of Americans who are utterly opposed to the social distancing and isolation efforts that are underway, broadly speaking. Those individuals have been protesting in public places and gathering in protests uh, in states like Michigan and uh, in California. There was a huge protest down um, against the the closures of the beaches in Southern California. Um, Many of these protest movements against the social distancing efforts have been combined with individuals that are also using open carry. So they're carrying weapons. They're being combined with uh, the political support for the Republican uh, Party and for President Trump. Uh, And they have... um, emerged as a as a group, not all of them, but um, some small minority of them as very invested in white nationalism and white power. And um, mm-hmm. there is a huge issue uh, in these protest movements where they are combining the freedom of assembly with some racially charged elements of it. And this is exactly the kind of issue that um, uh, Joel and Thomas and Brett Asaki were talking about, where um, religious freedom is portrayed as as being native or endemic or belonging to certain people who look and act and practice their religion in a very particular way. And if you're not a member of that group, the freedom to protest is um, or the freedom to practice religion is not open to you. And so many commenters uh, critiquing these protests against COVID restrictions have seen in them that uh, there is a kind of normative stance that assumes that it's okay for these individuals to be out without face masks, to be out without using social distancing um, measures, and um, that if those individuals, this is the, how the critique goes, if those individuals were not white, they might not be afforded um, the polite distance that um, they've been given and the space that they've been given and the platform that they've given. This is a, an extremely um, delicate and fraught situation, um, as you can imagine. And so uh, we're all watching it, um, hoping that everything is okay, and we don't want to wish uh, anyone illness, but we worry that that um, – uh, violating the restrictions against gathering right now could put people at risk. And so we're really worried about the way in which you're doing this. And to look at it from a critical perspective, um, from a theoretical perspective, we wonder why some people might consider themselves 
available and open to go protest that as as an exercise in freedom and talk about the ways in which that is a freedom of expression uh, in the same way that freedom of religious expression was talked about by um, Brad and Joel in this interview. Mm, yeah, definitely. I, I know that it's been hitting the news here in Australia and the imagery that has been used by our news media is certainly one that portrays that very strong symbolism of white nationalism. And there is definitely a conversation around that that concept of, of, of privilege even of those who are who are so-called privilege to, to protest or to social distance. And there's so many layers when we turn on a critical lens to these issues that are happening in our world right now. Um, yeah. What do we have coming up next week? I believe we have a discourse ep, Dave. We do. Uh, next week we're going to have a discourse episode, which means um, we're not really quite sure what's uh, about to be discussed. They're going to record that after we're recording this. And so perhaps we will get more discussion on these kinds of um, protest movements, as many of them are deeply connected to religious movements in um, Michigan, for instance, where the governor is of Jewish heritage. Some of the protesters held up signs that were very connected to um, Nazi propaganda slogans, including oh, um, what was written on the gates of Auschwitz, right? Um and so this is this is a very challenging um, time, and so we hope that there is a chance for uh, everybody to hear the discussion of these uh, time, things next time in uh, our May discourse episode. Uh, and so, until then, I think the only thing that's left to say is uh, thanks, thanks for, listening. for listening. The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals. <laughs>